Welcome to Unbiased Science, where we bring scientific method to the madness. We're your hosts, Dr. Jessica Steyer and Dr. Andrea Love. And this week, we're going to answer the question, what is the status of the current COVID-19 treatment and vaccine trials? So to, to, to break the ice a little bit before we get into this topic, um, which does get a little technical and, and, and sciencey, um, why don't we do a little this or that icebreaker? <laughs> and okay, so Andrew, I know we were bantering a little bit before we actually hit record that, um, you know, you, you say you're a little indecisive. <laughs> <and> so, <laughs> I hope this isn't too painful for you. But um, okay, so while you're walking, do you prefer music or podcasts? Oh, that's tough. I would say these days I've been doing a lot of podcasts, um, I, you know, since I, I've been recovering from my hamstring injury, I've been doing a little bit more walking than running. And I find podcasts to be a little bit more relaxing. I have the same answer. Um, I <laughs> definitely used to be music for me, but now I'm all about podcasts. Fun fact, um, I cannot listen to our podcast. <laughs> really? <laughs> I hate the sound of my voice and my anxious cackle. I just, I can't, I can't do it. So I feel that way about my voice. <laughs> uh, no, absolutely not. No. So I stick to my true crime and um, I don't know if you, do you know Office Ladies, Andrea? Do you know no. the... Um, so the uh, Pam and Angela from the Office. Oh yes, yes, yes. It's like my favorite show of all time. So anyway, so they they uh, they're going through episodes and giving a little behind the scenes. So love that. Oh, that's cool. Um, okay, next. What's worse, laundry or dishes? Oh, definitely dishes, without a doubt. I my first three apartments that I lived in had no dishwasher, and I swore when I got out of grad school and got a real apartment, the first non negotiable was a dishwasher. That is so funny. Was, I love doing the dishes. <laughs> <laughs> I find it so relaxing, the warm water. I'll put a little <laughs> podcast on. For me, it's laundry. I get my clothes in. I'm really good at putting them in the washer, but not so good about taking them out of the dryer and cold <laughs> Um, Okay. Candy. Oh, add a movie. Candy or popcorn? Oh, this is this is the queen of indecision here. I have to do both. <laughs> Sometimes at the same time, like dumping the candy in the popcorn. Um, I like the sweet and salty. I know we talked about that with our foods. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the and I like the really disgusting fake movie theater butter. Like I just want to oh, yeah. put extra of that on there. Um, but I also love some sort of gummy candy or something mm -hmm. like Raisinets, too. I love raisinets. So I'm I'm going to force myself to answer. As I said, Andrea, I'm a qu queen of decisiveness. Um, I if I had to pick, I would say popcorn. I, I'm with you. That butter, I kn I know it's no good, but you know all things in in moderation. You got it, and you have to shovel it into your face <laughs> like like your life depends on it. So definitely popcorn for me. All right, uh, pancakes or waffles? Oh, I'm really picky about my pancakes. I. I don't like most restaurant pancakes. Um, for some reason, the batter is not what I'm used to. So I'd probably have to say waffles. But mm -hmm. the caveat is I'm a New England girl. It has to be real maple syrup on both. I will never mm -hmm. eat fake maple syrup. Oh, yum. Oh, there's nothing like real maple syrup. <laughs> I got to go pancakes. Um, you know, I love both, but there's just, and it's so funny. I like the, like diner pancakes. So uh, don't, don't judge me, but yeah, I good don't. buttermilk pancake. Yum. All right. Last one. And this, this is my favorite, uh, beer or wine. Oh, that's a tough decision. I haven't been drinking a lot of alcohol these days for for a medical issue, um, just to limit dehydration. But I would have to say beer, just because there tends to be more variety. We've been really into gozas and sour beers, and there's a lot of new craft breweries coming up with fun varieties to try. Okay, so we are definitely on the same page here. I do love a glass of red wine. However, I'm super into beers and I love sours. And by the way, go gozes, I definitely have been mispronouncing that. I don't know <laughs> how, how many people I said like ghosts or whatever. I don't know how I've, how I've been mispronouncing that. Um, yeah, hate hoppy beers, love my sours. So same. I am not into IPAs at all. 
Ugh, gross. They taste <laughs> like flowers. I don't, don't, I don't like it at all. All right. Well, we got through the fun stuff. Let's, well, I guess this is still fun too. Fun for us. I hope it's fun for our listeners. <laughs> but let's, let's do a little recap of last week's episode. We covered research studies and research design. So we started things off with a primer on how research studies work and the factors that strengthen and weaken the validity of a study. So we set the stage with the discussion of the counterfactual um, that guides the selection of, of study design. Um, you did a really great, um, you, you talked about how research is hypothesis driven and how it seeks to address specific measurable questions. Then we talked a little bit about observational versus experimental studies. Um, and we spend some time talking about randomized controlled trials, RCTs, and, and the characteristics that strengthen our ability to draw causal com- conclusions. And then we talked a bit about clinical trials and their many phases, and that set the stage for today's episode, which applies the concept of these different research studies and clinical trials to the ongoing efforts to find treatments and vaccines for COVID-19. And everybody wants to know where we stand with these treatments and vaccines. I know, you know, we all have COVID burnout. We're ready for this um, to go away, but as as we'll talk about today, that that's not happening so quickly. But um, some promising um, research that's underway. So I know we'll talk a lot about that. So let's just do a, a quick refresher on the different phases of clinical trials, and we talked about this uh, in last week's episode. So. Phase one is primarily looking for safety and the best dosage, usually lasts several months, um, and we're trying to figure out the highest dose that can be safely given. Um, Usually participants are paid for phase one, and about 70% of drugs and treatments move on from this phase. Phase two, we're looking for efficacy and side effects um, in in people with the disease and condition. And this phase usually lasts several months to two years. About 33% of drugs and treatments move on from phase two. Next, phase three, um, we're looking at efficacy and adverse events. So these typically um, are conducted among thousands of individuals. They typically last years, uh, usually about one to four years, and about 25 to 30 percent of drugs move on to FDA review from phase three. Anything to add, Andrea? No, I think that was a great summary. Um, I think it's really relevant to um, the COVID vaccine trials, which we're going to jump into in just a second. Um, One thing I just want to emphasize is that, um, you know, the typical pipeline for clinical trials has obviously been accelerated in the case of a search for COVID-19 vaccines and also treatments. Um, and, And that can bring with it some challenges because some of these, especially in phase three, where where they're often conducted for years, um, we might not see some of these adverse effects or, um, you know, changes in efficacy until that duration. So I would expect even if we're accelerating phase three review and, and approval of some of these candidates that there will be um confirmatory studies or retrospective studies kind of as an ongoing effort to improve and and review the potential vaccines and treatments that are approved. So are you able to give us a rundown? You know, what is the status of these different vaccine trials? Can you give us a little update? Yeah, definitely. So um, so as we mentioned last week and just did a really great job of kind of summarizing the the, the three phases of clinical trials, there's also the preclinical phase, which is the, the lab research kind of to develop the technology and kind of ensure that, say, it inhibits, um, you know, virus infection in in cell culture or in animals. Um, There's over up to over 100 of those still in preclinical phases. So many of those may actually move through the clinical trial pipeline as time progresses. Um, So this obviously is a very dynamic situation, but the current status where we stand is there's 11 vaccine candidates that are in phase three. Um, There's 14 vaccine candidates that are in phase two, and there's 35 candidates that are in phase one. Uh, I also want to mention that China and Russia have six uh, vaccines that have been approved for limited use. But the caveat there is that they have not um, gathered the phase three results or data. So they basically kind of pre-approved these without the large cohort of phase three Um, results. And this can be potentially dangerous. We aren't going to focus on those today. We're going to focus on some of the more promising um, phase three candidates here in the U.S. 
So, uh, Andrea, I know that there are different vaccine technologies. Do you want to run through those, do a little review? Yeah, definitely. So, so as we mentioned, I think that was our episode two, where we talked about different types of vaccines and how vaccines work to establish immunity to a disease. So the existing vaccines that we have available for humans um, are based on one of four technologies. So we have live attenuated vaccines, which means they're a, an intact pathogen, but they're weakened, so they can't cause disease. They just establish that immune response. We have inactivated um, viral vaccines, so that an nice example of that is the influenza vaccine. So that means that the virus is inactivated, meaning it can't replicate in your body. It's it's not weakened. It's just outright um, not viable, but it's still intact. Um, then we have our subunit vaccines. So many of these are for bacterial pathogens. So they're a component or a piece of the pathogen. Um, and by injecting those, you're able to um, mimic enough of the pathogen to stimulate that immune response. And then the last type that currently exists are toxoid vaccines. So these are for diseases that the symptoms are caused by a toxin. Um, and then, of course, the, the vaccine itself is a mimic of the intact toxin. It's a modified version to, again, um, you know, mimic that immune response to the actual toxin. So I, I know that today we're going to um, summarize some of the key phase three trials. I, I know there were five of them that we were going to talk about. Um, I don't know if, if you're able to, to briefly take us through those and tell us. Sure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and, and obviously, as I mentioned, there's a, there's 11 in phase three, but these five are probably the furthest along, um, where they have an active phase three trial that's ongoing. Um, and we're, you know, starting to collect data. So, um, the first, the first one that I'll talk about is the Moderna NIH vaccine. So this is an mRNA based vaccine and, and all of these va five that I'm going to talk about are actually using new technology. So they're not based on any of the four existing vaccine technologies. Um, you know, some of that is a reflection of emerging technology and evolving science and all of that. But of course, the caveat is, is since we don't have an existing vaccine, um, a lot of this is, is really pilot. Um, so an RNA-based vaccine, basically what that's going to do is it's going to um, inject just the nucleic acid, just the genetic material of the virus um, into the, the patient. And so those RNAs are ultimately used to make proteins. So those RNAs would be injected into humans. Um, our human machinery, our, our human cell, cell processes would basically synthesize viral proteins from that. And those viral proteins would then trigger that immune response. Um, for Moderna, the phase three recruitment was completed in November. So our, um, the phase three recruitment will it be completed in November. Um, and this is going to include 30,000 individuals. Um, and that actually includes 7,000 individuals that are 65 years of age or older. Um, and that's that's really important here because that's our critical risk group, right? Um, you know, several other uh, vaccine trials do not include that high risk demographic. And we obviously want to include those when we're looking at efficacy of a vaccine and prevention of COVID-19. Um, Moderna has come out and said this this timetable will the trial itself will likely go well into early 2021 in order to collect enough data to determine if the vaccine is effective at reducing infection and also reducing disease severity. A Andrea, it's it's my understanding that mRNA vaccines, um, like the one that you're describing right now, they you know they, they're more they're safer than other live or attenuated vaccines, but they're actually difficult. Uh, there are challenges with regard to distribution, right? There's some of the storage requirements. Yeah, absolutely. So RNA normally is contained within a cell, right, or or a virus, right? It's it's in some sort of um, protected particle. Um, RNA by its Itself is very unstable. It, it degrades very quickly. And so it needs to be kept at minus 80 Celsius. Um, so these are going to be kind of deep cryo freezers in order to preserve it. So, um, you know, here in the U.S., it's going to be probably relatively easy to, to transfer. You know, we have dry ice or liquid nitrogen, um, you know, transport. But for some other developing nations or things like that, it, it may be very difficult to, to get them distribution of this type of vaccine. 
I think that that's so important for people to realize that, yes, you know, these trials where we're, we're moving forward full steam ahead, trying to, you know, make headway with these trials. But even let's say there, there is a successful vaccine candidate, um, you know, we haven't even gotten to the point of thinking about distribution. So it's Absolutely. not like, you know, it hits the market and we're all suddenly pr- protected from COVID. Right, right. Totally. Um, you know, and, and, and that's not even mentioning, you know, manufacturing capacity and things like that. Right. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Go. I, I Next on the list, I think. All right. So yep. the next one is actually, you know, somewhat relevant because um, this is the Pfizer BioNTech and Fosun vaccine. So this is actually also an mRNA based vaccine. So similar in, in meth- methodology and technology as the Moderna candidate, um, where it's using these, these RNA particles that would um, be be converted into viral proteins once injected, and then that would elicit that immune response. Um, in September, they expanded the trial to 43,000 participants. And this one also included children as young as 12 years old. And this happens to be the first COVID-19 vaccine trial to do that. Um, so that's really important as well, because obviously there's been a lot of chatter about, you know, what's the risk with regard to children, um, you know, not only disease in children, but also serving as potential vectors for higher risk demographics. Um, and we also don't know the long term consequences of children surviving this illness. Mm. So um, initially, Pfizer was pretty aggressive about their timeline. Um, actually, they had a press release as of October 27th. So that was on Tuesday of this. Uh, of last week, um, they had not collected enough data to conclude the trial. So this trial is still ongoing um, and they're still actively collecting data. Uh, and Andrew, I think, please correct me if I'm mistaken, but I think I was just reading um, press release with regard to this candidate. And I, I read that the, the data monitoring committee has not yet conducted any interim efficacy analyses. And um, I guess there are some interim uh, efficacy analysis that's been encouraging and that Pfizer is planning to apply for an emergency use application um, after it generates two months of safety data on half of participants, which is um, on track to occur the third week of November. Um, and that uh, Pfizer will have manufacturing data ready for the EUA, again, the emergency use application, um, before that third week in November. So uh, just basically a long way of saying that it's on track for EUA application by the end of next month. Um, I don't know. Can you, what does that mean? Like, can you tell us what what exactly that means? Like EUA, the emergency use application? Yeah. So, so EUA or emergency use authorization by the FDA is basically, you're you're accelerating the formal FDA approval status. And this is something that we saw with a lot of the COVID tests as well, where generally it goes through a series of review processes. You have a large cohort of data um, and it has very stringent requirements. Um, That's going to lead to your kind of formal FDA review, which is really where a a phase three trial completes. Um, And then during that phase four that we talked about last week, there's ongoing review and kind of retrospective data revision um, as as people are are um, kind of consuming the treatment in, in, in question. Um, so emergency use authorization, you have a smaller body of data, you have uh, a more as- accelerated timeline, but they show um, a moderate um, efficacy and, and, and safety where that FDA can grant them this accelerated, it's not a full approval, but accelerated kind of use so that they can start to distribute it to usually key demographics. So it could be high risk individuals, um, like medical professionals or things like that. Um, And it would have very strict verbiage that would go along with it. And that would also continue side by side with ongoing review of the the phase three trial data um, with the hopes that it would ultimately lead to full FDA approval. That is really, really helpful. And and sorry, I think I misspoke before I said emergency use application, but it was an application for emergency use use authorization. <laughs> just There's a lot of that. acronyms. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. Sorry. Take us, take us to the next candidate. Okay. So the next candidate is the um, Johnson and Johnson Beth, Beth Israel um, trial. And this is, this is a different technology. It uses a, a vector called adenovirus. So it's an adenovirus vector vaccine. And what this basically means is we use the exterior of another related virus called adenovirus. Adenovirus in humans cause very mild illness. Um, 
Um, this technology has been used in gene therapy technology. So basically you have the outside of the adenovirus and then you put the, the genome, so the genetic material or a piece of the genetic material of the, the COVID-19 virus, SARS-CoV-2, inside. So it's, it's a little bit of a hybrid. And this this has been used because it's it's has ease of delivery and because um, it's kind of this little um, delivery particle. It it has premise where it could be quite effective. So phase three trials for this particular um, candidate, Johnson and Johnson, began in September. They enrolled sixty thousand participants. Um, it was halted on October eleventh. So you know, just a couple of weeks ago, there was adverse illness reported in a participant. Um, they ended up resuming that trial eleven days later. So on October twenty second. As of right now, there's a little bit of a lack of transparency as to um, the the details surrounding this adverse illness. Illness. Was this a vaccine candidate or was this someone that got the, the placebo? But hopefully some of that transparency will come out in, in future days. Um, and Johnson & Johnson has stated that they hope to have some results of this trial by the end of this year. So by the end of 2020. Awesome. Okay. Next. The next one we have is the AstraZeneca Oxford trial. So this is also an adenovirus based vaccine um, using similar technology or similar principle as the Johnson and Johnson candidate. So again, kind of the exterior of an adenovirus and then inside that particle um, you have kind of genetic components of the SARS-CoV-2 virus um, such that it will lead to production of the viral proteins and establish that immune response. So for this one, phase three trials actually began a little bit earlier. This is probably the most accelerated trial. So those began in the summer, um, initially in the UK. So this is University of Oxford. Um, and planned enrollment in the US is about 30,000 participants. In early September, September 6th, they actually halted the trial due to a participant developing a very rare um, but serious spinal inflammation called transverse myelitis. Um, there was a review process that that was ongoing, and after that, FDA did authorize the trial to resume. These halts are not unusual. They're not unexpected. This is routinely done during trials. It enables them to review any potential um, adverse effects. That's part of what a phase three trial is for. Um, review them, determine whether or not it is because of the vaccine itself or it's something completely unrelated. Um, and then, of course, make that determining factor on whether we want to halt it um, indefinitely or forever um, or, or continue it, resume it. Um, and then the last one, which is probably less further along than the four that I've already discussed is, is a company called Novavax, which is based here in the U.S. Um, and they use a nanoparticle and a protein-based vaccine. So this is a new technology, but is kind of similar to some of our subunit vaccines. So they're using these little nanoparticles, which are nanometers in size, and they have, um, you know, proteins of the virus that will ultimately be delivered easily into humans and, and again, establish that immune response because the immune system is responding to those viral components. Um, a small UK-based phase three trial began in September. Uh, the planned phase three in the U.S. is aiming to start in November and, and results won't be available well into 2021. So I think that kind of leads us into the herd from the herd question for this week, which is when will a vaccine be available for us? Um, and I think based on the the current trials, these five that are probably the furthest along, um, you know, we may have early availability for some key groups by early 2021. Um, I wouldn't expect kind of ease of access to a vaccine in probably mid-2021 and probably widespread distribution, um, probably not until the end of 2021 or even 2022. Um, as I mentioned, some of these have challenges with manufacturing or distribution. Um, several of these require two doses, so you have to get a booster. Um, and ultimately, that's going to double the amount of manufacturing capacity that we need in order to deliver those. So, Andrea, let me just um, jump in here and just do a quick recap. So you you told us that there are currently 11 different um, vaccine candidates that are currently in phase three of clinical trials. So to recap, phase three is all about efficacy and adverse events. Um, you just highlighted five different um, key vaccine trials that are underway. Um, and you talked about three different types of vaccine technologies. 
um, the M- mRNA-based vaccines, the adenovirus-based vaccines, and the nanoparticle protein-based vaccines. And as you just said, all these different technologies have different implications for storage and for manufacturing and dissemination. Um, would you say that that's a fair summary? Yeah, absolutely. That okay. was fantastic. Um <laughs> <laughs> one one other caveat with the adenovirus-based vaccines. Um, so this technology is a little bit more established than the mRNA candidates, but um, there are no human vaccines that are based on this yet. There's there's one vaccine that exists. It's used for rabies and wild animals, um, but the technology is utilized in gene therapy. Um, so there is some some basis in using it as a delivery method. Um, and and this one because it's it's enclosed in this kind of adenovirus capsid, so this exterior. Um, it will likely elicit a nice potent immune response. But because um, adenovirus itself is something that humans are exposed to, they cause mild illness in humans, it runs the risk of, of kind of uh, an immune reaction against the adenovirus in the booster situation. So if we have to get a series of vaccines, um, that could actually lead to a potential adverse effect. And because people have already been exposed to adenovirus, they may not mount an appropriate immune response. So it might not be effective in everyone. So again, we're going to have to see where these trials play out um, in order to really determine what what the best course of action will be. Um, and, And also something to mention is there's obviously other things that are going on, right? There's other candidates that are in, still in phase two, candidates in phase one. It may happen that we have one of these kind of later phases approved initially, and then something better comes along that is more effective um, or, you know, has less adverse effects or whatever the case happens to be. So, you know, we're not going to table all the other candidates just because we have a few that are further along in the pipeline. Um, we have a lot of options and there's a lot of research that's still ongoing. I think we need a moment to thank science. I mean, <laughs> this is just, no, honestly, th- I know you're in it. You're an immunologist. This, You're just, you know, you, you live this all the time, but this is absolutely incredible. Think about what's happened. You know, we had this new, new virus. We have a, a global pandemic that started earlier this year. And look, like the whole world is scrambling to try to come up with a vaccine and possible treatments and cures. I I just, I think it's absolutely incredible. That's it. Yeah, I just have to give props to it's it's, it's really remarkable. Um, I mean, you know, we have creative minds around the world that are just, you know, so, so intelligent, so insightful. You know, um, we've, we've obviously been fortunate to base a lot of these you know, studies off of existing technologies, off of existing research. Um, you know, so really the whole body of of evidence, a body of science that, you know, has proceeded throughout history is really kind of, you know, enabling us to develop these things much more quickly um, with with higher safety. Um, and that kind of leads us into mm-hmm. a new a new vaccine um, trial. <laughs> So, so as I mentioned, phase three trials take a long time. So you have to have your group of vaccinated people. You have to have your group of placebo, so mock vaccinated people. And then you have to let them exist, you know, in the world and then compare who gets um, infected, who doesn't, what severity of illness is, is amongst the groups. And this takes some time. So typically these trials are, are years long and we're trying to accelerate these Um, by enrolling lots of people, but it still takes time, right? So there's a controversial um, trial that that may or may not happen called a vaccine challenge trial. And so a human challenge trial is is a study in which the control and the treatment group, so these would be the the people vaccinated for the candidate, the COVID-19 candidate, um, or those unvaccinated or or mock vaccinated, as we say, um, they're deliberately infected or deliberately exposed. So basically what's going to happen in this proposal is you're going to have a group of people, some that have received a vaccine, for COVID-19 and some that that have received a fake vaccine, um, and and they will be deliberately exposed to the virus. Um, And this study is is currently planned to be conducted in London. It's currently ongoing um, or undergoing review by by their version of, of, you know, FDA. It's called the UK Medicines and Healthcare Regulatory Agency. It has not been approved yet, um, but if it is approved, this trial would begin in January of 2021. There's been so much chatter about this. You know, there was an article published in Nature on uh, October 20th, and the headline is Dozens to be Deliberately Infected with Coronavirus in UK Human Challenge Trials. So um, I think, you know, there are scientists on on 
both sides of this, right? Pro- proponents uh, of challenge trials have argued, as you said, you know, that they could be run, um, you know, safely and ethically, ethically, and that they they have such potential to quickly identify, to really move things along faster, to help us identify effective vaccines, and that the benefit outweighs the low risk to participants. But then, of course, you have others who are saying, you know, raising all kinds of questions about the safety and value um, and pointing out that large scale efficacy trials involving tens of thousands of people um, are expected to deliver results on several vaccine candidates uh, soon. So um, I don't want to spend too much time talking about this, but I think it's worth pausing for a sec just to talk about the ethics of this. So, Andrea, I know, you know, we've we've spoken about this a bit offline and I had asked you, you know, um, what about blinding? You know, mm-hmm. it, it are the people who are signing up for these trials, will they know, you know, that they're being infected with with COVID-19? Yeah. So so if if someone agrees to participate in the human challenge trial, they will know that they will be deliberately exposed to the virus. And they in order to be able to, you know, consider any of the data from it, people in both groups, the vaccinated and the the mock vaccinated. So everybody's going to get some sort of injection. The, then And the participants won't know what they received, whether they received the potential COVID-19 vaccine or whether they received, you know, saline, salt water, basically. Um, so so they won't know what they, what they received as far as a vaccine goes. And then they're all going to be exposed to the virus. And this is going to be a strain of the virus that ultimately has been isolated from human circulation. So it's a a strain that has been causing disease in people. Um, It will be um, slightly modified in the lab, so slightly weakened through uh, a series of processes that we do in the lab, but it will still be infectious and it will still cause disease. So these people will be signing up willingly to potentially be, um, you know, infected, contract, COVID-19, develop disease, um, whether or not they've received a vaccine candidate or not. Mm -hmm. So to recap, you're going to have two groups of people, you know, half or whatever, you know, who will have received the actual vaccine candidate and then the other half will have received placebo and all of them will be exposed to to, to COVID. So there are going to be people who did not get the vaccine candidate who are exposed. Yes. Um, And Andrew, we were talking about this, that you know, uh, just to lay it all out here, to be totally transparent, participants are paid for participation. Um, Did you say, I think you did see the actual dollar amount that's being proposed? Yeah, the the organization that is is proposing this is a a contract research organization. And for their trials, they typically pay about 4,000 pounds uh, for participants. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't don't know the conversion rate to to US dollars off the top, but it is going to be happening in UK. So it's 4,000 pounds for them, um, which Mm -hmm. is pretty substantial. Yes. And and one thing I pointed out is that, you know, I, I, I have not run any clinical trials, but I have run several clinical research studies. And I know that, you know, if we are, if you do offer an incentive payment to participants, you have to be very careful. So remember, all of this research is so, um, you know, it's reviewed so thoroughly, so carefully by institutional review boards and, you know, to really make sure that human subjects are being protected. And so there's really Really, you have to strike a balance. You want to offer enough that, you know, it incentivizes participation, but not too much where it could be seen as like bribing participants and basically forcing them to, you know, look the other way to, to the risks and just kind of sign up because of that monetary incentive. So just wanted to point that out. I think that's something that's really interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point, Jess. And I think, you know, something that a lot of opponents to human challenge trials, and I want to, I want to mention that these human challenge trials are very rare. There's only been a handful of instances in our history that we've actually done these. So this is, you know, really just an unusual situation across the board, of course. Um, But, um, you know, we have to opponents of the human challenge trial are concerned that especially because this this trial, the initial one is only going to be open to individuals 18 to 30 years old. Um, You know, there's obviously not going to be any of your high risk demographics. They're going to kind of try and control and and reduce the symptom severity once someone tests positive for the virus and things like that. But um, that age demographic, you know, we don't want them to be cavalier, right? We don't want them to be going in and saying, oh, well, I'm young and healthy. Um, you know, I'm getting paid for this and, and, and again, diminish or negate the very real consequences of potentially getting ill with this. 
Absolutely. And let's just reiterate for all the listeners that this is just something that's being proposed. It has not yet been approved. Um, And I know we were wondering, you know, this is something that's being proposed in the UK. Um, I'm wondering whether this would uh, pass muster in in the US or how, you know, maybe it would be a longer process or, you know, anyway, just something to think about. But yeah, absolutely. It's a great point. And, you know, we'll it'll it'll be interesting to see how this approval plays out. Um, ultimately. Absolutely. Um, so so that's kind of that's kind of the the high level summary of the, the vaccine trials. The key takeaway here, there are no current vaccines that are available. The soonest we will have one, and that's if phase three goes, you know, as well as can be expected is mid 2021. And that's likely going to be much longer for widespread distribution and uptake of vaccines. All right. So we've talked about vaccines. Do you think we should talk about some treatments that are being studied? Yeah, let's let's do a a quick summary of treatments. I know everybody is very interested in the vaccine candidates, but there are some ongoing trials for potential treatments for the disease itself. All right. Do you want to take us down? This sure. Path? Okay. Sure. <laughs> so, so right now there are a little over 2,600 active or completed um, treatment studies that are listed on clinicaltrials.gov, and that's globally. Um, this process is a little bit less streamlined than the vaccine pipeline because there are many different approaches to treatment options, and uh, many researchers are taking what we call a brute force approach. We're taking drugs that are used for other disease conditions and seeing if they have any sort of efficacy against SARS-CoV-2. Um, but most of these treatments that are being tested are focusing either on reducing or mitigating the symptoms of the illness itself of COVID-19, or they're trying to interfere with the virus ability to replicate. So the life cycle of the virus. So it's really kind of two distinct branches of um, plan of attack here. I want to also mention that the NIH has very strict guidelines on what medical interventions, so medical professionals, what they can use on a patient unless that patient is actually enrolled in a clinical trial. And and all of that data has been published on, on NIH's website. Um, But we have a variety of different treatments that are in clinical trials. Um, And I think maybe we should talk very quickly about the the first chunk of them, which are ones that are attempting to interfere with the virus life cycle. So when a virus is infecting us, it has to first attach to the cells that it infects. It has to get into the cells through this receptor process. So you've heard about that ACE2 receptor. Um, And then once it's inside our cells, it has to reproduce. So it uses enzymes to reproduce. It uses protein, other proteins. So enzymes are proteins, but other proteins to help reproduce. And then it ultimately has to assemble. So it has to assemble in, it has to build its, its exterior capsid. So the protective coating, and then it also has to synthesize more RNA. So more genetic material. So all of these steps in the process could be points where we could interfere with it and kind of block that life cycle. One compound that was tested was this lopinavir, ritonavir um, kind of uh, compound. And this is used for HIV. So this actually is able to inhibit an enzyme in HIV that um, is participating in the processing of HIV RNA. Um, so the logic there was, okay, well, they both have RNA, HIV, and SARS-CoV-2, um, that that maybe this will work too. But um, the, the enzymes are very different. The two viruses are very different. And ultimately, the, the first round of clinical trials for this showed no benefit. Um, there's still some ongoing trials, but this, this potential treatment has really dropped down the chain of, of viable options. Jess, you want to jump I, in there with anything? Yeah, I, I was just going to say, no, I was going to move on to, you know, the next, <laughs> yeah. the next drug that I know has has gotten quite a bit of attention. Um, I don't know if you want to give us a, an intro to it, Andrea, but, you know, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, which yeah. you know, are usually used to, to treat malaria. So. Yeah, exactly. So malaria is a parasite. It's a eukaryote, I mean, it has a nucleus. It, it's not remotely similar to a virus at all. Um, and the parasite, the malaria parasite infects um, our red blood cells and causes disease through a variety of processes. But um, so the way that chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine work to treat malaria is very, very different than how it would ever work in the context of treating SARS-CoV-2. But there's a process in our cells that they thought 
um, you know, it might be might be um, effective or or uh, beneficial to to kind of test it out. Um, in the case of SARS v SARS CoV two, um, this particular step or this particular compartment in our cells is really not required um, for viral replication. Um, so it was a little bit of a stretch. But there was a lot of ongoing trials. It's obviously very easy to access and things like that. Um, but there was no potential benefit of these treatments after multiple ongoing trials. Um, Jess, do you want to jump in time. with Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I was just going to say, because really this has gotten quite a bit of attention. And, and I think that um, th- there's a lot of misinformation out there. So just again, there have been multiple, so many trials um, that have demonstrated no, no benefit uh, of these treatments for COVID. And, and in fact, the FDA has cautioned against the use of hydroxychloroquine hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine for COVID outside of the hospital setting or clinical trials uh, due to the risk of heart rhythm problems and other issues, including blood and lymph system disorders, kidney injuries, and liver problems and failure. So mm-hmm. this is this is not something that, you know, you want to take if you don't absolutely have to because there are risks associated with it. Yeah, absolutely. And 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 I do also want to mention that yes, it, it's a treatment for malaria. It's also used at low dose for people with autoimmune disorders like lupus, um something we talked about um during our immune boosting episode. Um but that is something that's used at a lower dose more routinely and that's that's monitored by a rheumatologist who is treating that particular patient with that autoimmune disorder. Um, For something like SARS-CoV-2, it would be a shorter duration and a much higher dose. So those potential um, safety issues um, are certainly a a greater concern there. But I want to, again, reiterate, there's no data that demonstrates there's a potential benefit for um, COVID-19 for chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine. All right. Should we talk about remdesivir? Yes, this is let's very do it. One. <laughs> yeah. So remdesivir is again, it's a it's a, a compound that's going to interfere with the virus life cycle. So remdesivir is what we call a nucleoside analog, and what it does is it it interferes with um, a an enzyme called RNA dependent RNA polymerase. And don't worry about what that means. Um, basically, what Phew. that enzyme does is it's required to produce baby virus RNA. So basically, um, you have a virus that infects your cell, you have to make a bunch of progeny, you have to make a bunch of new baby viruses that are going to then be released and infect more cells. So by interfering with that enzyme that's required for production of new viral RNAs, um, you're able to kind of uh, inhibit that viral life cycle and so reduce the spread um, of the virus in the body. Um, Now, this compound has is the only treatment that now has FDA approval actually as of last week. Now it is approved for limited use only. So the caveats are it is the first and only fully FDA approved drug for treating COVID-19. The FDA approval is limited to patients 12 years of or older, 88 pounds or heavier, and only in hospitalized patients. Um, Jess, do you want to, let's chat a little bit about some of the clinical trial data, I think. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, I think it's worth mentioning that remdesivir was previously shown to have some effect against SARS, MERS, and Ebola um, in cell and animal models. And there was a recent in vitro study. And again, you know, in vitro studies are done in Petri dishes or test tubes rather than in animals or humans. Um, And in that in vitro study, remdesivir prevented human cells from being infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes COVID. Um, I I know we also wanted to talk about, um, there was a recent study uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine. So there was a study of a a little over a thousand patients, um, and this was conducted by the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. um, And they released uh, some results in April and then later published in NEJM um, that found that uh, remdesivir reduced the medium time that it took a patient to recover from 15 days to 11 days with a 10-day course of treatment. They also found that the mortality rate in the remdesivir group was 7.1 compared to 11.9 among those who received placebo, but the difference was not statistically significant. 
Um, yeah. Can I jump, jump in, in jump really in. quick? Yeah. So, so this this body of data was a lot of what led to the FDA approval. Um, and what I find particularly interesting, so they were looking at different disease severity scores um, of hospitalized patients. And something interesting here is though we did see a, a modest reduction in mortality rate when we pooled everybody. Um, the reason it's not statistically significant is because it, there was considerable vari- variability depending on disease severity. And in that same study, there was no benefit um, of using remdesivir in patients who were either on mechanical ventilation or on ECMO, which is essentially cardiac bypass, um, which is an artificial method of circulating and oxygenating, oxygenating blood. So what that basically means is that in the most critically ill patients, there was no benefit of mm-hmm. using remdesivir. There was another study done in, in, in patients who were less sick um, that also found that remdesivir led patients to Im- improve more than placebo when it was given for five days, but not when it was given for 10. But I think it's worth mentioning that not all remdesivir studies have been promising. So in October, there was a large randomized study um, from the World Health Organization that found that remdesivir had little or no effect on death rate in hospitalized patients patients with COVID. um, And the death rate was about 11% regardless of whether patients got remdesivir or not. Um, And also worth mentioning that these results have not yet been peer reviewed. So some conflicting evidence there. Yeah, absolutely. One other thing I I, I think we have to talk about is that, well, two things. First of all, remdesivir is not like a pill that you could take at home, right? It's something that has to be administered intravenously. Um, And it's also very expensive expensive and not widely av- available. Um, so yeah, even even if you have insurance coverage, it's thousands right. of dollars for treatment um, so, using remdesivir. Yeah. And they just um, published the, the cost information. So for all governments in the developed world, including the U.S. government's um, Indian Health Services and the VA, um, the, the drug will cost $2,340 for a five-day cost, uh, course. Excuse me. U.S. insurers, in addition to Medicare and Medicaid, will pay 33% more, so a little over $3,000. Um, and then, yes, there are countries in the developing world that will get the drug at greatly reduced prices through generics. Um, but again, you know, we're talking two to $3,000, even with insurance, right. and that's very cost prohibitive. Yeah, I mean, I, I honestly can't even imagine what it would be for the millions of people who, who don't even have insurance. Absolutely. Okay. Should we move on, Andrea? Yeah. So, so those are kind of the, the, Hot hot button topics, the hot button <laughs> treatment for uh, inhibiting the virus itself. Um, the other kind of branch of treatments that we're looking at are ones that are attempting to alleviate symptom severity. And so most of these are what we call immune modulators, meaning they're they're trying to affect the immune response to the virus. So as you probably recall, um, you know many of these very severe cases and the um, associated pneumonia caused by um, the virus can often be linked to a phenomenon called um, cytokine storm, which basically means our immune cells are responding, you know, at rapid fire, they're producing lots of these inflammatory molecules. And that leads to a lot of inflammation, a lot of swelling and a lot of other um, undesirable consequences. So um, we have these these more generic immune modulators, um, there's compounds such as uh, tocilizumab and siltuximab. These inhibit some of these inflammatory cytokine signaling pathways. So one of these is called IL-6. Um, the rationale behind these are due to those COVID severe symptoms exacerbated by the cytokine production. So the logic is if we can reduce some of those levels, that might help reduce illness severity. Um, the, the jury's still out on the efficacy of some of these, and NIH has very clear guidelines as to when to use these um, in the context of a clinical trial. We have other generic immune modulators such as steroids. So one of the ones that we've heard a lot about is dexamethasone, um, and, and these are not indicated for treatment in mild cases. So these are only indicated for patients that are receiving oxygen, supplemental oxygen, or receiving a mechanical ventilation. Steroids, generally speaking, reduce um, global immune responses. They're immunosuppressive. And so in some cases, they're, they're not indicated because if you suppress your immune system, they can actually make you more likely to get other infections as a result. Um, 
And and the other thing to consider is steroids act globally in the body. So they have quite significant widespread effects. They they do inhibit the production of those cytokines and they reduce inflammation. They also induce cell death in some of these white blood cells, some of these immune cells. Um, but they also affect a wide variety of our gene expression, which, which can sometimes be very, very um, um, detrimental. So we don't want to take these too lightly. Jess, you want to talk a little bit more about dexamethasone? I I do. But before then, I want you to take a brain break. And I want to ask you, have you ever seen the movie Empire Records? There's a reason no. I'm asking. No? Okay. I don't think I have. I mean, it sounds familiar, but I don't think I actually saw it. So in the, um, you know, the little outline that we put together for today's episode, you've you've been um, abbreviating dexamethasone as Dexy. <laughs> and I was hysterically laughing because there's a line in that movie, oh, Rexy, you're so sexy. And I was just thinking about it anyway. Sorry. I'm hoping that someone listening knows what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> I'm going to have to um, watch the movie now. But okay, so Dexy, no, dexamethasone is a, as Andrea said, it's a it's a common steroid medication. It's been used for many years to treat uh, to treat various health conditions. Um, there have been some studies done that um, have shown some promise. So there was a study done uh, that found that there was a lower death rate at day twenty eight among 2,000 hospitalized patients with COVID who got a low daily dose of dexamethasone, either by mouth or by IV, compared to uh, about 4,000 patients who did not get it. So 23% versus 26% respectively, um, and that the difference was significant. It seems that it's most helpful for patients who were on a ventilator or needed extra oxygen, uh, but we've not seen that same benefit for those with less severe symptoms. Yeah. So again, you know, very, very moderate effects, you know, statistically that 23% versus 26% is significant. But again, if you look at it, it doesn't look, you know, super, um, you know, dramatic. Um, but one thing I think to keep in mind here is compared to remdesivir, dexamethasone is quite affordable and, and, and easy to access. Um, you know, so again, modest potential effects. I think there's going to be a lot more ongoing trials here. Okay. So convalescent plasma, that's also gotten a lot of, uh, attention, a lot of chatter. Can you tell us what it is? Yeah. So, so basically plasma is a fraction of your circulating blood that contains, um, uh, secreted proteins. It's, it's kind of like a yellowishy clear liquid when you separate your red blood cells out, um, and some of the other immune cells out. So, so basically you kind of separate components of the, the, the liquid blood and it contains, um, you know, proteins and, uh, platelets and things like that. But convalescent plasma would be collected from people who have recovered from COVID. COVID-19 and ultimately would then include any sort of antibodies that those people produced because those are protein components that circulate in your bloodstream. So the rationale behind that is you can treat people with the convalescent plasma that would have some of these antibodies against the virus that could maybe help reduce the symptom severity by binding to the virus and inhibiting them from um, infecting additional cells in the body. So in August, I know that the FDA issued an EUA, which, as we discussed, is emergency use authorization for convalescent plasma for hospitalized patients with COVID. Um, And interestingly, it was a reversal from a previous decision to put it on hold due to a lack of evidence. Um, So it does not mean that convalescent plasma has been approved or proven as a treatment for COVID, um, but the EUA makes it easier for providers to get convalescent plasma convalescent plasma in case they think it's worth trying for their patients. Um, And this decision was based on early data from a Mayo Clinic study of over 35,000 hospitalized patients with COVID who were given the treatment. Um, The paper has not yet been peer reviewed, uh, but they found that at day seven, the death rate was lower for the group who got the convalescent convalescent plasma within three days of diagnosis uh, compared to the group who got it after four or more days. Um, Worth noting, there was no control group uh, to compare this to. So it really, it's unclear if the difference in death rates was actually because of the treatment or other factors. Um, and death rates were also lower in patients who got convalescent plasma with higher antibody levels compared to plasma with lower antibody levels. Um, anything to, to add to that, Andrea? Um, no, no, I don't think, I mean, convalescent plasma has been used in some other disease situations as kind of a... Um, 
you know, stopgap while waiting for, you know, a bit more effective, um, you know, therapeutics or things like that. Um, you know, we're still trying to determine for sure if the antibodies we produce in response to infection are in fact what we call neutralizing, meaning they neutralize the virus. Mm-hmm. Um, again, there's there's a mixed bag of, of data here, you know, with regard to efficacy. Um, but there are quite a few kind of ongoing hospital trials that are utilizing convalescent plasma. Um, and I think that kind of brings us to the very last um, one we're going to talk about, which are the monoclonal antibody therapies. And basically what this does is it takes the principle of convalescent plasma. So we we respond to this virus by producing antibodies that are against pieces of the virus. Those are those proteins that would then bond or bind to the virus and inhibit them. Um, and we're kind of trying to make it more strategic, more specific in the lab. So the monoclonal antibodies are basically um, a more... Um, kind of rigorously controlled uh, procedure to produce those types of antibodies in the lab. Uh, Monoclonal just refers to uh, the type of antibody in question. I'm not going to get into that. Um, But because typically antibodies in response to natural infection can take many weeks to develop, um, especially for people that might have severe illness or might be on the path to severe illness, being able to produce these in the lab that would bind to the virus and inhibit them um, might enable Enable us to limit the people that develop severe illness by giving them these monoclonal antibody therapies um, in advance. So uh, m- my sense, and Andrea, correct me if I'm mistaken, is that there's maybe some preliminary evidence that they're helpful. Obviously, s- trials are still underway. Um, I know that there's a, a, a an Eli Lilly phase three trial of a COVID monoclonal antibody treatment that was actually paused a, a couple of weeks ago after safety. Uh, over safety concerns. Um, and that particular trial, the active three trial, um, was, uh, is, is testing monoclonal antibody in combination with remdesivir. And it's just one of several ongoing trials, um, designed to accelerate the development of, uh, vaccine treatments in partnership with pharma companies. And I think for me, it, this just really drives home why we have to wait. I know we're all growing a bit impatient, but we really have to wait for clinical data from studies before we can tout any of these things um, as as a cure. Yeah, um, absolutely. And and two two of the ones of monoclonal antibody therapies that you probably heard about. There's another one from Eli Lilly, and then also Regeneron has. Um, you know, they have some early promising data, um, you know, from from some of their clinical trials as well. But again, you know, these are going to have to be administered intravenously. They're going to typically be in the hospital and and there's going to be probably a significant cost associated with them, even once they are, um, you know, more widely available. And and just one last thing, and and then I know you're going to take us home, Andrea, and just summarize everything we talked about and and all that good stuff. But the, the trial that I just referenced, they actually just recently announced that it won't be continuing at all because they concluded that um, its antibody treatment does not work on hospitalized patients uh, with COVID, but they're going to continue to investigate it as a potential early intervention among those who are not critically ill. Yeah. Yeah. So overall, right now, um, there are no cures. There are no curative treatments and there's no vaccines available for COVID-19. Um, several vaccine candidates are in clinical trial. Um, they're in phase three, and and we may have some phase three results by, you know, the end of 2020, um, but don't anticipate a vaccine being available um, until mid-2021 at the earliest. Um, several treatments in clinical trials, as well as the FDA-approved remdesivir, show some promise in reducing disease severity in severely ill patients that are hospitalized, but even those effects are moderate at best. So we have no options to cure a person that has COVID-19. One thing to note, though, because this pandemic has been ongoing for many more months, um, physicians and other medical professionals are getting much better at intervening um, with supportive care, with palliative care before the disease progresses to kind of that point of no return, which actually is um, improving some of our mortality and and, uh, morbidity outcomes. Um, But as I mentioned, that vaccine candidate, that's that's not going to be available until well into next year at the earliest. Um, So taken together, our best practice is still of mitigating the spread of the disease is wearing your masks, um, practicing your good hygiene, 
um, more ubiquitous testing and tracing. I think Jess and I are going to continue to harp on that. Mm -hmm. Um, And of course, limiting your potential exposures through physical distancing and keeping your quarantine bubble small. Jess, is there anything you want to add before we wrap up today? No, I am just doing a chef's kiss over here. My public health heart loves that we're focusing on prevention right now, because as you said, we we just we don't have any curative treatments or vaccines at this time. So, yeah, yeah. do your yeah. part. Science takes time, um, you know, so we all have to be patient. We all have to be responsible. And, you know, I know the masks can be a pain, but they are really helping um, with disease spread. So thanks for joining us today. We hope you learned a thing or two. In our next episode, we're going to take a break from COVID-19 vaccines and all that. And we're going to talk about GMOs. Catch you next time on the pod, your trusted source for no nonsense, just science.